Welcome to Learning Aloud, a podcast from the Organizational Dynamics Community at the University of Pennsylvania, produced to inspire purposeful leadership practice and transform organizational experience. I am your host, Stephen G. Hart. My guest today is Dr. Alan Patterson, author of the new book, Burn Ladders, Bill Bridges, Pursuing Work with Meaning and Purpose. Dr. Patterson is an organizational development consultant specializing in executive and leadership development. Having led hundreds of clients for over four decades, Dr. Patterson continues to ignore standard coaching methods. Instead, he has opted to pursue and lead clients down the path of meaningful careers that are not only successful, but also deeply personally rewarding. He's worked with organizations from the Federal Reserve Bank to Hewlett Packard, to Major League Baseball and the United States Navy. His new book offers a refreshing and very practical approach to professional development that not only helps leaders break some old habits and thinking developed over a lifetime, but also helps them to create the mindset needed to achieve greater levels of purpose and meaning for themselves and those they lead in the post-pandemic workplace. I've had the pleasure of both knowing and working with Dr. Patterson over the last 20 years. It was a great pleasure for me to welcome him to our Zoom studio and have this conversation. Dr. Alan Patterson, welcome to the pod. It's great to have you with us today. Well, it, it, it's a pleasure for me and most the greatest pleasure is being able to rekindle our relationship. So I'm, I'm really happy about yeah, that. I haven't seen you in such a long time. And it's, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's great that this, this work that you've produced sort of reconnects us again in a very real and interesting ways outside of the normal realm of things. So it's exciting what's ahead for this whole thing. It's great. Well, I, pre- <clears throat> I appreciate that. Always yeah. uh, enjoyed our time together. So, you know, you, you write in the uh, description of the book, uh, burn ladder, burn ladders, build bridges, undoes the status quo of career development. So what do you mean by that statement? Well, the the way in which people, it, for sure in the U.S., uh, have thought about their jobs is that you do your job. If you do a good job and, and get promoted, you just continue to move forward. And my whole premise is it, not only is that not the case, it, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. So I think when you think of, well, if you burn, what does it mean to burn ladders? Jenny and I, my colleague and I have been back and forth on this several times. It's really a mindset. It's just, mm. it's like, I'm going to think about my work, what I do differently and um, so that that's really what I mean. Adopt a different mindset to how your career will progress. Yeah, I feel it's you know it's it's so interesting that in in the work I do, the teaching and the consulting work, I'm I'm really amazed at the number of people that I work with who seem to just go through the workday rituals as a force of habit, as opposed to really thinking about what they're doing. Have you noticed that? It I have and and. I don't know whether it makes me sad. That's probably not. It, it makes me angry. Yeah. That to know that you, I mean, I think all the folks that I work with, with you and some really stick out in my mind uh, as being really exceptional. What if, uh, why would people just kind of went through their job when in fact, it, I, I realize that it's a, it's a, it could be a level of motivation or for some it's, you know, punching the clock. But I, I just think, that anything short of being in this in a position where you can really shine is um, is a waste, and I, I think that's why I get so colorful with my language sometimes because it's like just wake up. You don't have to do things this, this way when it's I guess really none of my business. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's been around for a long time. I try to go back to see when this career ladder metaphor made its appearance on the stage. And I think you referenced it in the book saying it, it kind of coincidentally rose with the uh, rise of the uh, industrial age along with the American dream. How did you make that connection with those, with those two things? Well, the, the funny thing, Steve, and I don't know how much you heard about the American dream 
before you came to the America, you know, well, a lot, like, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it is really a big deal. And when I first thought I was going to write this book, I got really hung up in the beginning about where this came from and w- w- where these expressions came from and what was driving them. And I think the American dream is its own thing. Just even using the word dream Mm. is intoxicating to people, you know? And if you say who really believes in the American dream today, I think the people you will go to are people that have immigrated into this country uh, uh, because for them, they've they've aspired to be part of something that's, that's bigger and freer. But the way it connects to the latter is that the the latter is really a way to bring certainty to work. And so if you continue to work hard and do what you need to do to progress, it has that American dream quality to it. It's like I'm, I'm destined to be able to do something bigger and better. Uh, which is uh, you you could easily comment, you know, that's that's Americans believe that. And what I learned in doing some research around this, Steve, is there is a big sense of entitlement that I never really Mm -hmm. understood. And what I mean by that is to say, when you talk about the front discovering the frontier well that's bogus it's like you know we discovered nothing it was all it was it didn't exist until somebody saw it you know the tree fell and that we deserve that and could pretty much flatten anything in our path because as a country we, we settled it coast to coast and all of that has that rugged individualism everything that's associated with america just work hard just nose to the grindstone you know just pound it out pound it out Uh, achievement is rewarded and it the same thing goes for how you build it into the ladder it's just to me it's just um, affirmation that you're involved in the same process whether i mean i'm as much as i think i'm a, a psychologist i'm not but you could say, well, how, how this is really baked in to the culture, to the U.S. culture. It's not like people are consciously uh, directed or, or taught. Uh, you believe in the American dream. It's just the way things unfold, uh, only to find out it's, it's not as big a dream as we thought. Yeah, you, you use a lovely phrase in the book that uh, stuck with me. I've been sort of it's been buzzing around in my head since I read this. You talk about both the ladder and the dream as barriers, not promises. Yeah. I mean, that spoke to me very viscerally, having sort of uh, been attracted to the American dream and to some extent feeling like I've accomplished it. But it's, it's interesting. Well, you, you, I can't say you have or you haven't. I'm a betting man. I'd say, knowing the, the, the work that you've done and the quality of the work that you've done, that you've, it's been more gateway than a barrier. But, people of color and women look up at the ladder and they, they don't, they don't see people like them. Yes. So here I am an old white guy and it's just, and it's, it, it's, I, it never occurred to me that way. I mean, I, it, I think more the uh, new thinking that I had was not so much that the ladder didn't work. It's the, my approach was, well, I'll just work hard and I'll be able to see the fruits of my own labor. I didn't see any barriers that said, oh, well, you can't go any higher because you're Jewish, you know, and it's like the, those days used to exist, but they don't. So for some people, it's never been a dream. It's, it's only been disappointment. Yeah. You said uh, in, in an earlier remark here about uh, the foundation of the U.S., uh, corporate system sort of being more about rugged individualism. I certainly found that to be the cause. And and one of the wonderful chapters in the book, I think it's chapter two, is uh, titled Achieve and Advance. And are the seeds of this rugged individualism set in the way that we educate our kids? There, there's no doubt about it. Talk to me. I about mean, it. well, it, I, 
One is, uh, Steve, is that it, it's articulated in history. So if you're studying history, I'm assuming kids still study history, and they do, then you watch how where where the stories are, where the myths are, where the legends are. It's all about the Wild West. It's all about, you know, that's where we the image that we have of ourselves. So it it kind of reaches that more at a uh, that it, into people's psyche, the penetrating oil into our psyche to say it, it's there. But the other piece is, I think, clearer when you look at it economically and say, well, how does that figure in? Well, entrepreneurism, it's it, it just ties in that there are no barriers, or at least that's what we're people are told to be able to have your own business or pursue an occupation that that you want. And so I think you see it not just taught as a historical principle. I think you also see it uh, uh, around you in terms of the um, emphasis economically and, you know, the the whole capitalism and uh, entrepreneurism piece is, is very real and still very much a part of of not just of our economy, but how we define ourselves as Americans, anyway. Yeah. So what, what are you advocating then in terms of uh, some ways that we should reframe the way we educate and, and teach kids? It, you know, what's lacking in the workplace is a sense of purpose and meaning, a collaborative framework. So in your opinion, what needs to sort of change in terms of the experience that young people have in any level of education, I'm sure every time I have this question with people, I seem to get earlier and earlier in the process of formal education. But where's a good place to begin this indoctrination that a different future awaits for us? Yeah, well, I, I say it, it any way you slice it, it all boils back to your mother. You know, that's, yeah. that's <laughs> the, the, the work blames schools, schools blame families, families blame. OK. Um, I think a couple of things, and I think there's a, an awareness of this. Uh, call it what you will. I think the social emotional piece for kids is very important. I'm not saying at the expense of the what types of subject matter uh, are are critical, um, but it's that. Carol Dweck philosophy of, uh, you know, do you have a closed mindset about this or an open mindset? Do you, how do you define success? And when it's fixed or closed, it means you're setting yourself up to fail. What, you know, the closed system, as you know, the fixed system says there's a plateau, there's a, there's a mark, and you either hit it or not. Now, people could say, well, what's so bad about that? That's go, being goal-oriented. Goal well, the problem is, is that people define their personal value based on that. It's, I didn't fail, I'm a failure. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you look at, and the, and you see it in kids, she studied kids. I mean, I just read her one book, but I'm sure there are many, many more studies that support the kids that torture themselves because they're, they're not good enough. They, that story about that kid on a swim team at age 11 or 12 said, well, I'll never be Michael Phelps. So what's the point? And quit. Who says you have to be an Olympic athlete? Where's that uh, open mindset or where you're actually focusing on the, you know, word process or the, or the education. It's like, of course you're going to fail, but the experience is, how can I get better? How can I learn more and and keep it open in that respect? And I think that's what has to be encouraged. There's some people that, that would say, well, that's just fluff. That's snowflake philosophy. You're just saying everybody gets a ribbon. That's not what I'm saying at all. That's not what that means. It means, I don't know, how long did it take you to learn how to play the guitar or and, and other instruments and yeah. what, wh- how much better are you now and uh, however you define better than you were 30 years ago and and so if it's like 
well, I'm not as good as somebody else. Well, why is that the standard? Why couldn't it be? Here's where I am. Here's what I've done. Here's what I enjoy and and emphasize as corny as this sounds, the process of learning that I think. Well, you you said that back a few weeks ago when we we were meeting on my podcast kind of thing. And you in particular said, you know, it is so important that the emphasis is on thinking and education. And that's just cool. That's that's really where it's at. And and as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't mean people get get a pass on uh, uh, reading, writing and arithmetic. That's not it at all. It's not an either or thing. So you take the social emotional component that's that that uh, study that was done. You know, what do you think your parents want you to do? You know, it's get good grades, not care about other people. It's it's crazy. So all the emotional intelligence that I think people understand um, there, it really is something to it. And I think people really feel uh, less frazzled and put less pressure on this uh, on themselves and say, OK, so you had a bad night. What do you want to do? Shoot yourself for it? Yeah. And and the answer you, you you did a concert and it didn't sound right. You worked on a project and didn't go the way you wanted. I don't know. It's it stuff happens. So I think that in terms of education, it's an appreciation for that, but it requires more engagement to do that. Because think about it: if there's just this you either pass or you don't, you either succeed or you fail. It kind of takes the pressure off the individual to say, well, just you're going to have to try harder. What can I say, Steve? You yeah, just- it seems like we lose a lot from from our infant, infant status to becoming a more aware adult. We kind of lose the capacity to to just be playful with with ideas and with 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 things and and either the, the school system or our parents beat out of us the uh uh the prospect of failing and seeing it in a very negative light where i've learned truly that uh failing at something is definitely the pathway to renewal and learning and you know uh, it, as you said about playing the guitar you know i i've had a, a an acoustic band and i can play all day and all night in my basement but it's only when i get out in front of an audience that i recognize whether or not we have anything to offer here you've got to be willing to put yourself in that position Absolutely. to learn whether or not you have something worthy to offer and um how do we rekindle that capacity well you know again this was got uh, was part of a discussion you and a couple of co- other colleagues and I had uh, a few weeks ago. And Jenny and I thought a lot about that. I mean, we were really moved by this. And I don't know that everyone would agree or, or, or see it the same way. And that is we're, we're saying, I'm saying, I said this in the book, the, the creativity and the ability to make not, it's not just thinking logically or analytically that I I understand it's being able to make sense out of that. Mm -hmm. You take curiosity and creativity on one side and you take judgment and discernment and the more rational thing on the other and say, those, those are the rails, not just what you accomplish. So if the, we've engineered out the, the school system has engineered out the creativity side and that and so the focus becomes really a solo mission it's your job is to do good to to get good grades to pass the test to memorize the passage and and do it better and quicker and faster than you have before and that's the sense of achieve in advance okay now what's next you go from ribbons to uh, scholarships you go from from scholarships to you know being number one in your class and all that stuff sounds good and sounds aspirational and why would you be anything less and i think it's really the acceptance that your your mental health and emotional health for sure are based on how you see yourself and your sense of worthiness and there there is no major premium 
in, in the educational world, unless you're an art major, I suppose, to say that the, the level of creativity um, and animation that is so prevalent and curiosity, it's like I had a client just recently, someone I hadn't seen in years, but a former client, he called me, he said, I'm getting killed by my new boss because I had all these interests in other things besides just the science. I wanted to learn supply chain. I wanted to understand the finances. And he told me, his boss being he, told me, just do your job. Yeah. And you're not. And it's like, I don't know, who would you want to be working with or for? Yeah. Or have worked for you, somebody that had an interest in their in the business and understanding that, or somebody that was just good at one thing. I, yeah. So, well, it makes me wonder about the, the the amount of human potential organizations throw away. The the, the to me the agencies that's all over this is Gallup, and Gallup says you know both worldwide and in the U.S. Uh, the, the level of engagement, people say that they're very engaged uh, 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 and engaged in their work is around 30 to 35 percent. That that tells you 65 percent of the people in, in these surveys are saying they're not engaged. It's like saying if I rated your plane on a scale of one to five, five being uh, your uh, uh, a virtuoso and one being your slug. and I rated you a three. Let's imagine I rated you a three. Is that something you would be content with? Is that something you would want to understand better? And the answer is, of course. So I, I think that being able to get people to understand what's really important has been a, a major difficulty. Yeah. And all this other stuff comes to play. Right. So we need to tap in then to that 65% of people who would rather be somewhere else and create a different kind of experience for them right. in the workplace. And I would contend a maybe a modified model of how people are led in those circumstances. Because when you ask those 65% of people, what's the source of your dissatisfaction? It's, this, it's the quality of the person that leads them, not necessarily the head of the organization. No, it's a the person most directly relatable to their responsibilities in the workplace. So there's something fundamentally wrong with the way that we create experiences for people in the work, how we develop them, what else, what uh, opportunities we give for them to learn and grow within the workplace. And no uh, it's getting worse. <laughs> well, I and that this is what I don't understand. I, I do, but I don't. I mean, if I told you, I don't have to tell you because you know it. I thought. I mean, when when consulting, the talent development got to be a thing. It's like, you know, once you got beyond time management is that's what people needed training for. What's what's what what's the number biggie? What's the biggie on the on the hip right? It's about communication. It's like, OK, I thought maybe that was all covered that people know that. And it, it has never, ever, ever gone away, ever. And so you say, well, people aren't good communicators. How could that be? And then you look at, excuse me, I wouldn't even call him a leader. You look at, I don't know how this will jive on your podcast, but you look at people that have no emotional intelligence or that are leading that have, that are idiots, as I think of them, <laughs> and feel that the only way that compliance it is the name of the game. Can you, those people still exist. I talked to somebody yesterday. She was so senior in her organization. She, she told me she almost left a few years ago because her boss, she didn't call him an idiot, but that's basically just it cost everything. She said, I had no desire yeah. to do anything. I gave zero. So I think, Steve, that this is going to be when asked, and I don't think there's any new insight here uh about the hat well aren't you know you talk about ladder burners aren't you talking about good leaders absolutely positively and it's not so and it and it has to do with who's at the center of their universe and that has to be the people around them that's yeah. the job the job is to make others successful oh well that sounds really you know yeah touchy feely well 
It is. What, are, what, what can I tell you? That's your job. Help your team succeed. Create the conditions for them to succeed. Well, so that's, oh, guess what? Companies are more profitable. You just look at the research that you would find from uh, emotionally intelligent leaders to uh, what Gallup has to say. It's the higher engagement leads to, I don't know, you want to measure profit? Measure profit. But it's there. Why? Because people give more. And that's the key. How do you get to that? And you don't get to it by sheep dipping everybody and thinking that they're going to be led or managed the same way or or the way that that's my style. But to me, this is old news, but apparently it isn't, Steve, because there's still people that are that are in management positions that way. Yeah. And I th- one, of, one of the other tenets of your book or one of the other consequences, I should say, of what you've just described is those people who don't have that sense of uh, relationship with their boss who who is open and willing to learn, they, they end up being in this state of being stuck. Yeah. Right. So talk a little bit about that. That was a, that was a fascinating segment of the book that I liked a lot. And I could recognize it a lot in clients that I work with. Yeah. who report the same experience to me and yet don't know quite what to do about it. Well, I'd like to think, and this is not an original thought, I'd like to agree with those people that say, well, being stuck could be a wake-up call, really. Mm. It's not It's not as bad as you'd think, but it, 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 it sucks. I mean, that's, why do people get stuck? I say that it, it, it's the their desires, their, their motivation, what really are critical and important to them, um, the organization they're in and the people they're working with, if those things don't align with each other, um, it's easy to get stuck. And so the, the problem is, um, from, from a psychological point of view, is that over time, the more it, it, that you are in a position where you get comfortable, not because you're doing what you want. It's just because you've kind of kept it at a certain level. So there's no pressure to do more or or greater expectations. And then after a while, people say, well, I'm not so sure that I want to do this or that my life or job, I should say my job is not fulfilling and wh- whether it's because they bumped up against the tough boss or whether they're in an organization they don't like. So it's what what's that all about? And if it's if that's the case, it's easy for me to say, well, qu- quit your job, and go find a new one. And many people say, well, they can't do that. But I don't think that's the only way in which people get stuck. There's this thing that goes on inside of people's heads of. Am I really doing what I want to do? And is this all there is? And what's it going to take for me to be happy? And I'm not getting what I need from my boss. And this is where I've turned it on its head, Steve, I think. I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one out there advocating. Well, guess whose job that is? That's your job. Yeah. And you read people that really are into career development. I think of uh, um, Her- Hermania Abara, who's yes. taught about Okay, taught at Harvard and she taught internationally. And she says, and I agree, you don't think your way out of stuck. That's not how it works. You do. So, Steve, I don't know. You're having a tough time with a guitar? Put the guitar down and go. You play piano? I don't know. Try it. See, find it. Go to your buddy that's so good and she'll teach you a couple of things. It's like, Oh, I could do that on the guitar. <laughs> well, you know the the other side of that 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 gets into the head a little bit, and uh, and we'll talk in a little bit about what ladder burners actually do. But the, another deterioration in the workplace of some of the effect of the 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 impact of the ladder thinking is the lack of connection to meaning in what we're doing. Right? There's a sort of a downward spiral of. The, the more the workplace becomes miserable, the less we connect to it, then the less we seem to have any purpose or value in what our activities lead to. And you interesting uh, that you draw that back, too, to the Industrial Revolution, the sort of division of labor and all that stuff. Yeah, well, Talk a little yeah. bit about the, the origins of that. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be I'm going to be I can see it now. That I'm going to be a socialist now because I'm saying, well, <laughs> but think about it. You take 
well, let's just start. Start. I, I, we can start one of two places. You want to start with the 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 pioneers in this country or the early settlers, or you want to start with kids because it's we're really talking about the same thing. There is this wholeness about what you're doing as a kid that you just accept that because you don't know anything different. It hasn't been parceled out yet, assuming you've had a decent. Uh, 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 an opportunity to, to be successful in your very early years, loving family is really what I'm pointing to. And then all of a sudden the stuff starts to get stripped out. This, this, you know, what my value, what my worth is really has to do with what I do and what I accomplish. And I think to get that, to keep that, um, an organization has to have that environment where people can try different things. They're not, they're not penalized for taking uh, a risk. And I'm not suggesting you can do that in a nuclear power plant or the Fed, by the way. I don't think there's a whole lot of leeway of what you, you, you can or couldn't do. But I think the ability for people to understand and appreciate what's critical and important to them happens because they are having what you and I are doing right now. And it's a conversation about it. it it's go. I don't know, Steve, you ever played the, the kazoo? I mean, you probably have. It's like, I don't know. You could be a virtuoso on that. Nah, that's kind of stupid. No, it's not. Go out and yodel. I don't know. And it's, and, and the whole point is that, It's the ability to try different things, to understand. And when you surround yourself, when you think about the people you've surrounded yourself with, how much does that tell you about you? And I am complete. This is no accident. I would never have known this. The difference between you and my buddy, Mark Walters, is really not that much. He shares many of your interests He's a really bright, thoughtful guy. He loves the, I don't want to say, it's not the the academic as much as the conceptual side. He loves music. He loves everything about what he's doing. And that's no accident that when you surround yourself with people like that, you start to understand what's critical and important to you as opposed to thinking you have to do this on your own. Yeah, it's... it's um... I, I've I've often had the privilege of working with young emerging leaders in an organization, and um, we've come to this notion that think about your career there as not just the lane that you're currently working in or swimming in, but what else is around you that you have potentially some interest through or even some talent for that you has yet to be discovered. You won't know it's you won't know about it. Until you start being curious, you're asking questions, you're you're networking with people outside of the area that you're working in. And I tell them to think about their career opportunities like climbing a rock wall. It's not yeah. one way up. It, sometimes you go down, sometimes you go across in order to get up. And how yeah. do you navigate through the space that you're in to find touch points of new meaning and purpose for you in the, in the work that you're doing, even if it's in the same place? you might find deeper connections to something within the place you're already working. If you look on it. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's how you do it. You're not confined by thinking the only way is up. And I, and I say, uh, ladder burners, uh, don't break the rules. They, uh, change game. They just play about it differently. So when you realize you have interests in other areas besides what you were working, uh, what you're working in, it's like, well, how do I do that? Well, everything starts with a conversation. So who are the people that you could be talking to about this? That, I mean, again, back to Barra, she says the worst people to be talking to are the people that know you the best. I don't know that that's all true, but the point being is that you're looking for uh, some fresh thoughts uh, for some ideas. I, I, I talked to a fellow a couple of days ago who just finished the book. I mean, this was a great plug for the book. And this is a fellow that's worked, I'm guessing, 20 years in the sales mm. area. And he said it wasn't until he saw the, the, the phrase that I used about only one person's responsible for career, your career development because nobody else cares. And that's you. 
Right. And he said, I never thought of that. I never thought I could design my own job. And I'm saying, well, what stops you? Yeah. And what stops most people is they think that somebody else is responsible for giving them what these options are. And I'm saying, no, you can make it up. And he said, well, you can't do that at, at, at where I work. Well, I don't know. Have you tried it? And if you can't do it and it's important to you, then maybe you're not working in the right spot. Right. You know, one of the things that's in the book that was very powerful for me, and when you asked me to review one of the early um, versions of the book, uh, this really resonated with me. At heart, I'm a very deeply reflective learning type person. I absolutely love the questions you ask at the end of every chapter. Yeah. And uh, they were so powerfully thought provoking. And I know you didn't just make them up out of you know, out of nothing, you obviously put a lot of time in to think about them. Tell us a little bit about the generation of those questions, because every one of them is just absolute gold. Well, I, I appreciate that. I'm not so sure that I, I, I saw them all as gold, but I really appreciate your perspective, Steve. I, I wanted to have something that could answer the question, so what? People get stuck. So people get stuck. Seven year rich. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, don't think your way out is stuck. Okay, it's it's the so what. And that it's like, what questions could you ask or more of what I'd love to see? And I, I, I'm really eager to hear how this works for you and your class. It's what are the, the, the discussions around these issues when people are talking about, you know, what's what's the role that they play or they feel they should be playing? Um, how do you work with uh, how do you accept a, a, a neg a negative working relationship or something's not working out? And I'm saying, I, I, I mean, for me, that's pretty hard because I don't have much tolerance and I, I have a thin skin. So it's like, OK, I buck up, you know, and it's like, yeah, OK, maybe not. So the point in writing those questions was really trying to capture what is and here, here's a good one, because this one's to me is hard. What does it mean to have impact? What's the reason for that? Why is that so critical? Because it, to me, the reason is if you firmly believe in something strong enough that really supports other people being successful, how much are you willing to go for that, to fight for that? And so I'm saying, forget all the stuff and negativity you hear about persuasion, and influence and, and uh, politics, baloney. If this is important, you, you can learn it as well as the next guy. You may not like it. You may not be a pro at it, but you, at least you have to appreciate it. So you get people thinking about, OK, who are the influencers in this situation? That's just a, a logical outcome of saying I want to have impact. Well, impact with who and how do you do that? So it, it's a, uh, some are very those questions, I think, Steve, are, are really more are, are pragmatic and others are like well how like the the uh clayton christensen quote you know how will you measure your life i'm like oh my god yeah yeah you know, yeah where do i go with that yeah, you know it's interesting the book to me and, and a couple of people that i know who have read it now who have recommended it to and we've had a chat about it they say you know it kind of works on two different levels one is the sort of a self-assessment you know what's my own uh, feeling toward the work I'm doing and the the track that I'm on and the level of engagement, satisfaction and purpose and meaning I get from my work. You can certainly discover opportunities for the self in there. But the part that really appeals to me as an executive coach is really the, the chapter that begins with what ladder burners do, right? Because here's where now um, we start to reorient the minds of people who are in influential leadership positions about doing things differently. And you identify five critical things that a ladder burner does. And uh, I'm wondering, um, you know, talk a little bit about each of them just a bit and give us a sense of it. But I love the notion that this is this is stuff that's eminently learnable. Oh, gosh. Yeah. With, a, with, a, with a, a, a leader who has an open mindset. 
Ab- a- absolutely. I mean, I, you and I, I, I know we're kind of, uh, we're educated, are educated in the same uh, field in the sense like, okay, which comes first, behavior or changing mindset? And it's like, well, let's go after the behavior because we can be concrete about it. Now, will that change mindset? Maybe so, maybe not. I wanted to approach this a little bit different. I'm saying the, the first step starts with any job, whether you're going to climb the ladder, build the ladder, burn the ladder, have your own business. It has to start with a base of competence and credibility. You've got to be good at something. Hmm. And why? Because it shows a, a pr- pride or in, in what you're doing. Now, your first job's not your last. And you could say, well, I started off uh, you know, in the mail room, and that's not my aspiration. I'm saying just just be good in the mail room. Don't, you know, first, second job, just enough, you know. And the other thing that is so often overlooked, and I don't know who the role models are on this, and that's really kind of important. You either have to have a good boss or you have to read, read the book, is to uh, build as part of that base is to build a base of credibility. And that's all about how you provide value to other people. As corny as that sounds, Mm. but that's what it is. It's not how smart you are. It's not how good you are. It's not how many degrees you have. It's not about being smarter. It's about being more important to other people to help them with what's critical to them. Why? There's this is instrumental in the beginning because it's the basis for building relationships. What can I tell you? So it's a basis of truth and it's a, ba- a basis of credibility. Then I, I, I was thinking, Steve, well, what's next? Well, you have we because we, I know you must feel the same way. You know, this isn't like, well, leadership is leadership, regardless where you are. Well, it looks different. And what makes it look, diff- look different is the context in which it's happening. Now, most people think that's a job description. It is bigger than a job. What I'm saying is, to hell with a job description. You need something to get going. And, and organizations need them to document for all kinds of purposes. But what I'm saying is you're creating a context to understand, to start to understand this meaning thing where you can start to build out from what you're working on to the bigger picture. And that context is going to include people. So now I'm trying to populate my own little world here and say, okay, who's critical as I see it from where I sit? And I don't know if that means you're dealing with the president of the Fed in your district, or or is it just the, the people that are two levels above you? The, the point is, is that you start, I can't tell you, only that you start to see where and how does my job fit in? Who defines this? You do. Mm. You do. So now you're taking that ownership of defining what that context is. Then now we've changed. Now we're on a different path because now I'm saying it's not that expertise is not important and competence, meaning expertise is not important. It's very important. But the build out is not on that technical side. The build out is on building relationships. So now you're at the bridge. And so if I had a visual, it's like there are two lanes going into the bridge. You got technical, you got emotional intelligence. You get to the bridge. That's number three. And now it's all about building relationships. Not that that hasn't happened, but that you start to put a premium on this, whether they're people you work with, people you need to know in the organization who are influential or people can help you with your career. I mean, there are many ways to characterize this, but this is not just building networks. Networks, in my mind, you know, connections are, I don't know, can you get me a couple of tickets to the to the Phillies? <laughs> I said, can you give me tickets to Hamilton? Come on. <laughs> you know, so those are connections. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, those those could be uh, people that, you know, acquaintances, but you look at connections as a way to build. It's a means to an end. When you talk about building relationships, relationships are the end. That's not there. Yeah, yeah they, people can help you and all. But this is where you're headed, because the more 
the better connected you are, the better grounded you are through understanding what's critical and important to other people, the greater, the, the, here's the more self-serving part, the greater your opportunities are. Who knew? see that you and I would be working together. I, I it, it just, it, any of the jobs that I really thoroughly enjoyed when I was consulting, it's like, how the hell did this happen? I, I don't know. You put yourself out there. That's the bridge. And the bridge is everything people. And if you did nothing more than stay there as, you know, build that basic competence and credibility, uh, define what your, um, uh, the context of your work is because that's going to change. The players are going to change. The job requirements are going to change. You build bridges. Now we're into the really good stuff because with those relationships, this is how you create impact. And I think it is so learnable and so doable. And let's just drop the BS about sucking up and playing politics and trying to get people to do what they're not, they don't want to do. No, that's manipulation. That's mm -hmm. not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how do you, Steve, I, I got a question for you. Here. How do you think I should approach Jeff M on this? What do you think is the best? And now you're empowering me to figure out, okay, how do I get, an idea passed through. Selling your ideas and gaining commitment is huge. I'm not saying I'm going to get it every time. I'm not saying everything that I recommend is the best. I'm not putting myself on that pedestal. I'm just saying it is a skill set like no other. So the communication, the listen, the active listening, the that being able to speak to the level of the audience, that goes back to that building credibility. You can't blow by those skills. And, and organizations allow people to do that because they have the technical competence. So now I've got impact is number four and number five is the, is creating meaning. And th that one to me is tough. It's like, well, what does that look like? Well, it, it's going to depend on what's critical and important to someone, to a person, which varies. That's in the intrinsic motivation. And so, how you get at that is to understand it's really deep inside of saying, this is the stuff that I really like. This is the stuff that gives me joy. And it may be for an instant. If you're lucky, it may extend over a period of time. But I know where I'm headed. I had that happen this past week in recording the audio book. I just, I just, I don't know, something about being in front of that microphone and thinking I'm doing stand-up comedy or something, Steve, <laughs> it's just like, what's the big deal? To me, it was a big deal. Yeah. And so, and everybody's big deal is different. So it then says, how can you help people do that? And if you're looking at it organizationally, now we have a real concrete discussion on our hands. It's like, so how do you do that? What do what are the expectations of leadership? Um, yeah. And ha ha what if I told you I wanted to go from engineering to finance? You know, what's my pay going to be? What's my title going to be? And it's I'm not saying they're not important. Uh, it's just all those things can be figured out. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling like um, the 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 assembling of those five elements and the integrated nature of them and the ability to learn them uh, really inspires two things. One is uh, if you're if you're able to integrate these ideas into your role as a leader, you are really offering an invitation for people to co-create with you. In the Unbelievable, world, right? And then the second part of it is, I think, uh, not only do the people that work with you and for you have a greater sense of accomplishment, but, but you you know, leading suddenly becomes fun again. It would should be, <laughs> you know, and, and <laughs> you've, you've suddenly found now, hey, there's real purpose and meaning to what I'm doing as a leader, irrespective of the kind of work, could, no matter what right. the field is, it it has that effect of just raising everybody's game yeah. in, in the in the work and and finding that connection with people. Margaret Wheatley once said, "We don't know who we are until we're in relationship with others," right. and this this offers That's the it. chance to be in that deep yeah. level of relationship. In, in in bounded by the, the, the joys of the work we do together. And, and I'm saying that now we're at it, partner. We're there. That's the state I want to be. You say, well, you didn't say this. 
people are going to argue and, and say, well, that doesn't last forever. No, nothing lasts forever. No, that's no. not the goal. It's not like, okay, see, that's the fixed mindset. Yeah, I, either yeah. it's going to be euphoria or not. Blown it. Yeah. Doesn't have to be like that. I got a chance this past weekend. I was I was on cloud nine, you know. And and to your point about when you can help other people be successful, there's something about that. I talk about a couple that I met when I went to a, a on a photography trip to Northern Ireland, and that they, they were I, I I I came to love them. I mean, they were just just really dynamic people, and um uh. The uh, person, the husband was, had worked in sound engineering as part of the development of the, in one of these internet related, pre-internet related government sponsored programs in a, in a university. And his, his wife was also part of this. Point being is, unlike Al Gore, they really did work on the internet. And when they talked about those experiences, it's like, I, I mean, you should see this. He, he showed me a video of the first what looks like uh, the first kind of video call that was done in the 70s. And it's so archaic. He was so proud of it. And he said they're, they're just that, you know, people would stay up all night working on these projects. And it's like, what causes somebody to do that? And they talked about it like it was yesterday. So you can only imagine how meaningful it was yeah. to them. But let me tell you, I got sucked in. And then it makes me think about the other people that I like, like Mark Walters, like you. It's just like, it's just fun. It's just a kick. Yeah. And I don't, and, it, and it's non judgmental. So it doesn't matter, you know, what's, what's this in comparison to? I, it, it's in comparison to nothing. <laughs> yeah yeah uh, another part of it though i think in terms of sustaining the glow around this is when leaders discover these paths and be able to implement them uh other leaders in the organization who catch that same fire can be mutually supportive of each other to be able yeah. to uh teach you know guide one another to be a guide on the side to be a, a confidant to be a a, a peer coach to, to keep it going because it does take some energy to keep it going and there will be setbacks. But if like-minded individuals are, again, co-creating leadership together, then it's a lot more fun than doing it on a, your own. A great way to put it because that's what it's about. So now we're back to creating. Ha, yeah. ha, ha, not ha, 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 you. I don't know. Give me the sandbox. Yeah. Just lay, lay it on. I'm ready. I'm ready to go back there and say, let's just build it and see you know, I, I, I say that the joy is uh, when we have those relationships, these the ability to do that kind of creation and co-creation is just magnified. You want to do it. Yeah. It's like I said to somebody the other day that, you know, what I'm shooting for is not to get on MSNBC and hawk my book. I want, <laughs> I, I want, a, I want an off Broadway production. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I said this to someone and he said, are you serious? Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know. You know, I keep saying it. It's like, well, or, or, and someone said, well, why don't you write a children's book about this? And it's like, ah, mm -hmm. that's kind of interesting. Yeah. But the, the, the point is, it's like, I don't know. Could this be an off Broadway musical about I, who knows? Wow. But the, but the point is those that's out there, but there are so many opportunities that exist because as you ha have described it, Steve, it's you're creating, I'm saying context, you want to call it space, you want to call it license to, to create, you want to talk about creative imagination, you want to talk about creative, like Linda Lee did talk about creative intelligence. It's like, yeah, that's the stuff I want to hear about. Yeah. That's the stuff I want to help people with. And um, I think that's why. And this is another point. You use the word. I think what we're seeing as a need and I'm not inside and I'm not working with clients now go up to the level you are. I, I think this new evolution, this new transformation is, you know, it's still there's still people that are managers that need to be leaders. I think now it, it's. How do you help leaders be teachers? Yeah. 
Well, you know, it's interesting because the, the, there's a lovely little uh, intriguing little chapter at the end of the book, chapter 13, Miss Hughes School for Little Folks. And uh, tell us about Miss Hughes and the commencement address. Uh, who was the fellow that did the speech at Kenyon College? John, I can't remember his last name. That was such a well-noted speech about, you know, he wasn't going to say everything you, uh, um, you know, you, you can be anything you want to be. Uh, it, so it was a bit of a satire on this. I, I wish it's silly because I'm asked this enough. I need to remember the guy's name. So it was a takeoff on that. I went to Miss Hughes School for Little Folks. And I thought, OK, here I am making a big deal about the joy that people have is really how do you go back to the playground psychically? Right. How do you how do you take that spirit, which you have? I said to somebody the other day, I said, you know, you can only tell that because they smile a lot. It's like, what the hell is your problem? What are you so happy about? So I thought, what if I gave a commencement address to my to kindergarten class mm. and tell them? I mean, I guess people would have to know me that I was over their head for a reason being snarky about this. It's like, OK, kids, here you go. These really are the best days of your life. Yeah. It's because it's, from this point forward, you're going to find that there's going to be a, a, a diminishing return, that something's going to be taken away. And it's it's not like, you. well, some people are harmed. Let's just face it. You know, it's not that it's like once you get the, the I said the reading groups are named for birds. Once you get in the wrong reading group, you know, it's kind of hard to avoid that stigma and it continues and it continues and it continues. But Miss Hughes School for Little Folks was my kindergarten class. And it's like and when I told some folks in my hometown when I was there over Christmas time, they were hysterical because they had gone there, too. And it's like. It, it's not, I'm not talking to kids, I'm talking to adults here, you know, understand what, what, to use your word and, and mine, which I absolutely love, it's, I didn't know this starting out, I'm really talking about joy, what brings you joy, and, and with all the, it's not just the current state of the world, I think it's just in life, and kids, Kids have it hardwired until we engineer it out of them. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it goes back to the point again where I said uh, you wish that that w we could get these lessons right at the very heart of where our education system meets the kid. And so it, it's, it seems appropriate you're ending back in the in the elementary school to 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 with your message about don't give up on that and don't let people breed these capabilities and this joy of learning out of you as you successively go through your layers of education and ultimately into your career. Yeah. I, I mean, the, I, I clearly put the focus uh, by the time you're leaving the equivalent of secondary education, whatever choice you make around that. And, and today there are many things and they're all, uh, I'm a believer that people that are going to technical colleges, especially here in the state of Wisconsin are, are walking out with great jobs and, great capabilities. Uh, I think the onus in really in those early years is on the teaching mm. and the quality of the, the people that are teaching. Teaching is not easy yeah. and teachers are highly prized. I, I don't know. Well, you, you've gotten this, whether they're 10 years old, uh, maybe with your granddaughters or you've taught in, I taught in, in uh, junior high when I started out, yeah, right. but clearly you've taught college stuff is when somebody comes back to you and says, what, a, what a kick. Yeah. What are, and I, and I've called up one of my professors who I really, really, really love uh, died several years ago. And I, I just, I found his son on LinkedIn and called him up and said, your dad meant the world to me because mm. he, he, he just the things that he told me about that I've never forgot. Yeah. But well, such a great legacy. And if, if more leaders and, and people catch this, I, I want to thank you for spending time in our, uh, on our podcast today. And again, it's at the, the book is burn ladders, build bridges, pursuing work with meaning and purpose by, Dr. Alan Patterson. It's such a pleasure to see you again. I can't wait to, to have you visit my class this uh, fall of 2022. It's exciting. Looking forward to that. And 
I'll Absolutely. tell the kids to tighten their seatbelts. It's going to be a good there, ride. there is. We're going to take off. They probably boot me if I if I'm able to make it on campus. I'll probably get escorted off, but I'll take right. that risk. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Alan. Thank you Thank so you, much Steve. for spending time yeah. today. My pleasure. My guest today was Dr. Alan Patterson, author of the new book "Burn Ladders, Build Bridges: Pursuing Work with Meaning and Purpose." This has been a Learning Aloud podcast from the Organizational Dynamics Community at the University of Pennsylvania. My sincere thanks to Dan Shields for producing today's show. I'm your host, Steve Hart.